So our guest today is Deepa Child, who's going to talk a little bit about how we can create these digital first communities with a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. Is that a new concept to you? Me too. Buckle in because we're going to learn a lot today. So who is Deepa? Deepa is a social entrepreneur who's passionate about technology and social impact. She has previously worked with Salesforce Foundation, helping nonprofits adopt cloud technology, and is currently focused on helping change makers, that's all of you, embrace the future of doing good. She's the founder of Impact Media, which is an open source knowledge repository on Impact DAOs. And definitely go check that website out. We'll put the link into the chat. Lots of great case studies and other examples that take this idea and make it concrete and tangible. And so she's really focused on helping people use this new form of digital social impact organization management. I was just very intrigued to understand these new kind of organizations. And I have done such a deep dive into it. I'm like literally have had like one-on-one -on -one interviews with 60 people, founders and contributors working in these organizations to just get a very holistic view of what it is like to start an organization on the internet. And I, I really believe that organizations of tomorrow will begin on the internet because it's just such a more natural place for everybody to be these days. We are spending more and more of our time on the internet and it's just a more natural phenomena that these organizations begin here. So let's, let's start with what we're going to be covering today. We're going to talk about the problem that we see um, with our current model doing good. We're going to talk about how DAOs are addressing those problems. I'll give you a few examples of these communities. Like DAOs are basically online communities. So just if you don't want to deal with the word DAO, that's totally fine. These are online, digital, very decentralized communities on the internet. So we'll go through a few of those examples and then how to get started. So yeah, the problem is trust. The trust is the most important currency. And currently there's a lack of trust in institutions and in organizations because of their closed door operations. We don't get a view of how they are operating and, and donors don't trust organizations that they don't know where the funds are going, how the funds are coming out, why certain grants were decided. That's the number one problem. There's a failing trust in institutions. The second problem is that as nonprofits, our audience is we have different audiences, but they're not one big community for us. We treat them like they're very fragmented. They are siloed. For instance, we might tease for team, like you have a core team that's working and doing stuff and getting things done. Then you have volunteers, which some of the team members interact with, but the volunteers aren't interacting with the donors or with the, the entire team. Then you have your donor community which is basically you sometimes engage with them like through annual reports or through donor events, but it's not all the time engagement. And then you have these enthusiasts, people who are just excited about the cause. Say, I want to help kids with kids' education or I'm interested in starting like a hacker space. So they, you will find people outside your little circle who's interested in your cause and how do you go about finding those people and start engaging them. So these I feel like the whole, there's this segregation and we are not treating them as one big community because they're all part of our community, our cause, whatever cause that we are trying to address. Also, it's very hard to get started. If you're passionate about something, you want to do, do something, it just start, like for instance, start a nonprofit. It's such a process. You need to find your board of directors. You need to have an MOA. You need to go get registered. You need to find an office space. You need to open bank accounts. It's not easy to go mission first. because You want to go mission first, but then you get in involved with all this other bureaucratic infrastructure stuff. And then it's hard to grow. Like you are just always localized when we are living in a global world. Like it just, internet is one world. There are no boundaries. You can tap into resources from anywhere. And people can join you from anywhere. So it's as a nonprofit, you end up, or as a physical based organization, you just end up being very local while you, you might be addressing a global call. Or even if it's to do with your just city of Vancouver, there's so many people from Vancouver who have moved out and are all over the world might want to get engaged in the cause because you're doing it for Vancouver, right? So it's easy to grow on the internet. But these are the things that the problems that we face today, it's hard to start, hard to grow. 
So enter DAOs. So DAOs are decentralized autonomous organizations. That's the word D for decentralized. I'll take you through these letters, but the most important thing to know is that the ethos is of building in public. Whatever you're doing is happening in public. All your discussions are happening in public. All your meetings are happening. All your documentation is shared. All your grant, how you're making grants is all viewable and visible. So it, when you build in public, you build trust because people know your thought process. People know why you're doing what you're doing. And it's very community centric. The focus is about having a community and having the community co-design with you rather than you being a single mind or a group of five nonprofit professionals trying to address this big issue. It's, let's have everybody engaged. And there are ways to do that. I'll go about that. It's also very light and fast. It doesn't cost anything to launch on the internet. All you got to do is start a Discord server. That's where most of these DAOs meet. That's their office on the internet. And just let anybody and everybody who's interested in your cause get into that server, onto that Discord. It's, an, it's, it's a meetup place. It basically started with the, got popular with the gaming community. The gamers wanted to chat with each other. And so it was a tool for them initially, but now it's gone pretty widespread. Almost anybody who wants to launch a community just starts with Discord and that's where the community meets. And so it's very light and it's, it's fast. You don't need to open bank accounts. You can literally open a bank account on the blockchain. These days it, t- it's, it's, uh, it takes a few seconds and, and you're, you're, you just, are live basically. And if you don't want to deal with blockchain, there are other hosted services like Open Collective that you can leverage to just take care of your financials and all the legal requirements. There's another one in the Web3 space called Endowment that I, that is trying to automate fiscal sponsorships for US nonprofits to begin with. So you can be a fiscal host with them and you can get all the benefits of extending tax benefits to your donors and stuff like that. So there are these hosted services and you don't need to really go through the whole infrastructure thing. You can just get started with your mission. So that's the beauty of DAOs. So DAO is just another cool for distributed online community. As I said, it's not localized. It's on the internet. It's distributed. People from anywhere who's passionate about your cause can join join the community. There, there is no gatekeeping. It's like really the entry points are like there are no barriers to entry. Basically, all they need to do is find you on the internet and just join you. And, uh, and so I would say, don't get intimidated by the word DAO, like D is basically, it stands for distributed and decentralized, like that decentralized in the sense that you share governance with them, you, sh- you engage them in your processes. And obviously it's a so- slow process of decentralization. We keep saying in Web3, decentralization is a journey. So you obviously begin as a core team, but then as you find more passionate people around your cause, you start decentralizing with them. And E stands for autonomous. Now that's, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Autonomous basically means that when you start acknowledging your, your contributors, your volunteers, your donors through using on-chain blockchain based tools, or you use, say, for instance, a blockchain based bank account, then you are literally unstoppable. You are autonomous in that sense. You're sovereign. Nobody can totally shut you down. If you are hosted, say, with with a particular organization like a cloud service provider, if something goes wrong with them or they remove, if you're on Twitter and somehow you got get blocked, you're always at the mercy of one controller. But because we are using blockchain here, it's dist- it's a distributed ledger and uh, you are basically unstoppable. So that's where the autonomous part comes in. Also, it comes in terms of certain things can be automated, like your smart contracts. I'm not going to go very deep into it because this is just the very first session on on where does the autonomous part comes in. But just to give you an example, for instance, you can, when you have voting, which is done on the blockchain, you can have a smart contract that says, okay, once we receive 75% approval, then trigger the smart contract that will release the funds from our bank, from a blockchain bank account into this particular organization that we want to make a grant to or into this particular department within our organization that we want to endow them with funds. So basically, there are these smart contracts that can trigger things for you, but I'm not going to go deep into it. And you can totally forget about it. Like when you start as an online community first, I think what's most important is that you focus on the on the community and then just decentralizing with the community and autonomous part can either come in or never come in. But the fact that certain things, you're, you're, the tooling that you're using, the decentralized apps that you're using, it makes 
your organization pretty independent of everything because it's on a distributed ledger. And as I said, I've, I've really gone deep into the space. And the last year we conducted an intensive study of 12 DAOs that are DAOing for impact, like social good. And we spoke to almost 40 people, like three or four people from every organization, every DAO, just to get a very holistic picture. And what after talking to them, this is what we learned about these organizations. Firstly, they're internet native communities. They're by design on the, they are on the internet. So they're very forced to think from a very internet first ways. How do we be effective in terms of getting work done on the internet? How do we decentralize? Because decentralization is a big, it's a big value proposition. And so they're always thinking, even if they're not decentralized today, they always have it in their roadmap that this is how they're going to be decentralizing. They're transparent because they're using blockchain. All the transactions coming in can be recorded on the blockchain and all the transactions going out can be seen on the blockchain. Decentralized governance, distributed teams. So even if they are local, as I said, one of the organizations we studied is a hyper-local mutual DAO mutual aid DAO based in New York City, but they are, they have distributed teams. There are people from all over the world that are collaborating and helping and enabling that DAO. It's called Pact DAO, and I'll talk about them a little later. They're distributed teams. Even if you happen to be local, your team is still from all over the world. And basically you live on the internet. You don't really have an office to go to. It's your office is your Discord server, if that's your choice of where you want your community to hang out. And your sovereign entities in the sense that nobody can stop you. We've seen that. Ha Just to give you an example, Ukraine DAO is a DAO that was formed when Russia attacked Ukraine. And so this DAO was quickly formed on the internet and they mobilized funds for the Ukrainians. And there was another nonprofit organization called Come Back Alive that was trying to fundraise on Patreon for the same cause. But Patreon shut them down at that point of time. They said that they are fundraising for the army or something. But basically, the situation early on when this was happening was that almost every man in Ukraine had to pick up arms. They weren't even allowed to leave the country. So it was very like, and they never really used the money to buy any weapons or anything. It was mostly to buy all the protective gears that were needed. So they were shut down by Patreon while Ukraine now had their bank account on the blockchain. And they very smoothly continued to fundraise. They raised $7 million just doing a mint of the Ukraine flag, which is like a, they used Ukraine flag as a non-fungible token. They minted that and people contributed to it and they raised $7 million. That was actually my starting point into the world of DAOs because I was just fascinated by the whole unfolding of events. And they totally did a build in public on Twitter. Like they were so transparent from the time, like how things were happening, the whole chain of events was put out on Twitter and I actually documented it into one of my articles, like from the time, like they started the multi-sig and then the chaos, even the chaos, like so many people are galvanizing around the cause. So everything has been documented and it's like a total building public transparent, like things go wrong, they discuss it in public. There's no shying away from it. And, or things are taking time, they would come and talk about it in public. Why we haven't set this up yet. So it's really fascinating. And this is the org structure that we've seen. It's very flat in the sense that there are no hierarchies. There is the bigger community. Just about anybody who's interested in the, in the cause can be part of your Discord, like your one place on the internet where your community is meeting. I keep saying Discord because that happens to be by default the place where almost all DAOs meet. All work gets done on Discord. And so you can be just sitting, you can just join a Discord and keep lurking and keep being there in the background, just listening and observing to everything that's happening as part of that organization. And then, and once you're ready, once you like the culture, the ethos, you feel excited, you can generally people from the community jump in to become like contributors. They want to be, they could be paid and paid contributors. Mostly almost all impact thousands are run by volunteers, like they're all unpaid contributors. But then there's a way, there's a system in place to acknowledge them. You can issue them badges. You can issue them like you've completed this work. You can get a little NFT for that. I'm going to talk about those later. But and then that's about timekeeping on the public ledger. They've invested so and so time for the activity and it's all recorded on that blockchain on the public ledger. And it helps build their reputation. They can take that badge and go to the next organization and say, hey, I've done so and so work. It's, and it's all very traceable because it's on a public ledger. And I know LinkedIn had added this feature when I think in your profile, you can add like where you volunteered and stuff, but this just 
it makes it more verifiable because it's on the blockchain. Who are these organizations who are issuing these badges? Like you can just track the whole chain. And then there are co-contributors. If you've invested enough time, you can be a co-contributor. Mostly co-contributors are the full-time employees. So any full-time employee is called a co-contributor. And, and then within that, there are different work streams. And the way they organize on the Discord is that they put their different work streams as different channels, like different departments. And within that, they can have smaller teams, pods of about four or five people, which every time they need to do a sprint activity, they can just form a smaller pod. So this is the kind of organization structure that almost every DAO follows, whether it's around science. We have so many communities around science, like longevity and synthetic biology. They're all starting with a community first approach. And this is how they all organize. This is like a very standard operating organization structure of internet communities. And yeah, this is the basic toolkit. Almost every DAO or every online community has this toolkit. Discord is the place for the community to hang out. Then they have something called a discourse. Because as I said, these communities are very conscious. They want, or these organizations want their community to feel engaged. And it's not just lip service. They try everything. They're always consciously trying, experimenting, iterating. I know that sometimes like they've gone like to the extreme end of direct democracy, have every single member vote on every single thing. But then they've realized since 2021, when the DAOs really took off, that's not very effective. Let's not bring everybody to vote on everything. It's, okay, what should be the color of the logo? Let's get everybody to vote. And they've realized it's a total chaos. It doesn't work. Complete decentralization decentralization is not the solution either. Everybody's not trying to find a balance, but discourse is where they put up all the proposals, everything, like anybody can come and propose. If you're a community, like if you are in your discord, you're passionate about, say you do regular beach cleanups and you want to propose something, you can put that discussion in discord to begin with. And if you have enough people like liking it through emojis and stuff like that, you can actually put out a formal proposal in discourse. It's like soft voting and say, hey, from this nonprofit, I would like to request so-and-so funds for undertaking this because we've got enough votes, show of support on discourse. So now let's discuss it on discourse. And after that, it goes for voting on snapshot. That's the symbol of snapshot, which is being heavily used by almost all DAOs. It's, all, it's voting, but it's on chain. And so people can then come and vote and see live, you know, how that proposal is happening. And so the whole process is very transparent. And if they get enough votes, it, you know, you can, uh, and if you are community centric, you can just say, okay, we've got enough votes. We've got enough people liking, okay, this is the $2,000 we like to give you. Go do what you started. And uh, so that's basically uh, Kimball Musk. He's the brother of Elon Musk. He started a DAO in 2021. He runs a very big nonprofit organization in the U.S. called the Big Green DAO. The nonprofit is called Big Green. But he wanted to experiment with, with decentralized philanthropy. Let's see, instead of me and my team deciding on how the money should be given for various community gardens across the United States, Let's get the people on ground people engaged in the voting process because they know the situation best. So they are the ones who are close on the ground. They know where the money should be directed. And he initially gave out votes to seven individuals. And those seven individuals, were, uh, he didn't give a vote to himself, but those seven individuals decided where the grant should go. And all the proposals that came in from the nonprofit, they had to make a proposal on snapshot. And those seven voters had to take the token it's uh, it does not have any monetary value it's just a token to say that you have one vote and they went and voted on snapshot and so the whole process the entire history of that organization if you go to snapshot you can just take a look all the proposals they voted on why is which ones got passed which ones didn't get passed and uh, this fox uh, the symbol is of metamask it's a wallet because you are in interacting with decentralized applications and so Instead of logging in with Google or Apple, this is like a way to log in into these apps. And when I first started into DAOs and I started volunteering with one of the DAOs, I was helping them like create accounts on various different fundraising platforms, you can say in Web3. I needed a MetaMask to be able to log in at that point of time. Now, many of them are trying to make it more mainstream. And so they do have a login with email. But they didn't have last year. And so that was my first use case of using a crypto wallet. I'm not here to trade or anything. I just want to log into these decentralized applications 
And so I need a wallet for that. If I need to create an account on Snapshot, I need a wallet for that. And that's what Kimball Musk also did. He just got these nonprofits. You, you're, okay, you're submitting, you're part of a grant making process. You're submitting these applications. Okay, get, let's get you a wallet. And it's this new world, but he trained them. It's a process of training your people and everybody got a wallet. All the ones, the, the people who are working on the front lines of these community gardens got a wallet. And everybody has gone through that little learning process of using a wallet to log into these decentralized apps. And uh, this little symbol is of this, it's called SAFE. It's, it's a multi-sig bank account. So if you are fundraising in crypto and you want to be the owners of your own bank, you don't want it to be through Giving Block. I know Giving Block is very popular with a lot of nonprofits, but you can be, you don't need them. They are again a gatekeeper, I would say, because in this world, we want to get rid of the gatekeepers, right? We want to take, be able to own everything. So you can just literally go open a bank account with the core people that you trust, make them as multi-signatories. It could be your board members or it could be the core team members. And just start taking in donations from from people directly into those into that vault on the blockchain, and that's where your money is. So multisig means that when you say, okay, I'm going to have three out of five people sign every time we release funds. So you can have five people on that the joint bank account, and you can put in a condition that I want three out of five every time to sign before we release any funds. And this is basically Zora for NFT fundraising. So you can these are a very it's a, a lot of nonprofits are actually benefiting from NFT fundraising, like tons of like this was something they never expected as a revenue stream. But in 2021, when the NFT scene was crazy, like a lot of money went to, I think, close to 25 million or something. They never expected this revenue stream. And it's become a very standard source for a lot of nonprofits. But you can just do your own mint. These applications are becoming very simple. You can just mint an NFT which is basically just a picture. If you are in Save the Whales, for instance, if that's your cause, you can just put a picture of that and you can say, hey, we're going to do this mint. It's You don't have to price it very high. You can even say it's $20, mint this badge, be a part of a community. It's your contribution or it's whatever. And you can do a fundraiser yourself directly. I think this unlock non-transferable NFTs or building your on-chain identity is something that I find the most interesting because even if you don't want to deal with cryptocurrencies or anything, you can totally get started with this and Discord and Discords and voting. That's it. That should be the part of your toolkit because you can then start giving these badges. It's like a badge of honor that you give to volunteers. Right now, you give them like a paper certificate or an email certificate. But this is you're building their reputation on the blockchain and it's decentralized reputation, something they can take with them to different places to different organizations. And this is the most exciting part. This is something I'm really bullish about because I feel like a lot of this would be an entry point for a lot of people who are afraid of crypto, but want to be like here, want to embrace some of those ethos and non-transferable NFTs means that it cannot be traded. There is no speculation about these NFTs. These NFTs needs to be earned from an organization for doing certain things with that organization. And so you earn these NFTs and they cannot be transferred. So the speculative part of the Web3 culture, which Web3 is infamously known for people speculating, like it removes that. It totally removes that from it. And there are this very cool tools. I've been using a lot of these myself. One is obviously for publishing. When you publish articles or anything, you can just put it on. This is an on-chain publishing platform. You can do a free mint in the sense that people can collect it for free. If they like what you've written, they can collect it for free. And it just it establishes the provenance. You publish something on the internet. Now, who owns it? There's a whole chain of people. You can see how, who's owning what builds transparency. And you can sometimes even fundraise with it. You can say, this is an article that I'm selling. You can mint it for $8. And people who really like or value what you've written will be happy to pay. And this is one way to start socializing with the Web3 audience. If you've been an outsider, if you want to start slowly, gradually come into the space, you can, this is one way I would say, start putting your organization's vision, mission, start writing on, on, on say, Mirror, this on-chain publishing platform, and just do free mints or do very small nominal mints if you want to do. And a great way of socializing with 
this whole Web3 world, which is which is pretty fascinating. It's 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 a great place to be, I would say. I know there's a lot of bad narrative around it, but it's a really great place to be. I'm a social entrepreneur myself and I'm in this space. And and they use certain decentralized applications for just managing tasks and proposals and documentations. And Chambers is a popular one with impact thousand thousands that are there to make an impact. Think of them as any social impact organizations. And I put them specifically because I know they have a default template that you can just take and everything is on chain. There's, 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 when, you're doing, when, you're building, when you're building online communities, I think do- documentation becomes very important. You want people to be self-served. They can just go and understand what's happening where, what proposals are going. Everything is transparent. There is nothing like in your own little laptop or your own Google Drive or anything. It's everything is up for everybody to view. And that's the beauty of building in public. It builds trust and trust brings more people in and they become your storytellers. They will get go and tell the next person, hey, this organization is great. I completely know what's happening here. And, and that's how the word spreads, basically. I, okay. So these are a few of the DAO examples. They're DAOs for, they can be DAO for anything. You want to start a community around beach cleanups to neighborhood cleanups to addressing global issues. Like you can just start a community for that. It doesn't have to be massive. It can be small and it can be big at the same time. And so Impact Market is one of my favorite examples. They are doing decentralized, unconditional basic income in places where it's very hard for aid workers to be. So for instance, think of refugee camps of Afghanistan. People in those places still have their smartphones with them and all they need is a crypto wallet and they've been giving them unconditional basic income in a stable coin, means it doesn't fluctuate. And they've created circular economies in these places, which is really fascinating. So think of them as Give Directly. I don't know how many of you are aware of Give Directly, but they just give money out. Like they, they have realized research has proven given, give money to poor people and they know best what to do with it rather than you telling them how they should spend it. And so they just give free money. So does good dollar. It means they're not targeted to poor people. Anybody can claim, like you and me can go claim this money. And they're trying to create circular economies. It's a hard problem they're trying to solve. But I feel like these, they will become more and more mainstream, especially with AI coming into the picture as well. I feel like UBI is an important part of it as well. If you look at Sam who started ChatGPT, OpenAI, basically his other venture is WorldCoin, which is giving UBI to people. It's a coin, it's a token. It's an unconditional basic income to people. I feel because I feel he sees some kind of relation with that. But nonetheless, this is free money. And then there's tons in the public good fundraising space. If you want to, as an outsider, if you want to fundraise in crypto, you can go on give. I would say Gitcoin is really great. Gitcoin gives out, when you fundraise on Gitcoin, you are paid, your grants come to you in smart, in, in stable coin, which is really great because it doesn't fluctuate. Endowment is great uh, if you're a nonprofit and they have like nonprofits from all over the world because they've partnered with, I think, uh, I forget the names, but there's one umbrella organization in the U.S. that it has an API. And so they pulled in basically all the nonprofits from the U.S. And now they've partnered with another one based in London. And so they pulled in all the nonprofits from the world over. So they have about, they're like in almost every country. And any crypto donor who wants to make payments, they just do, it's very smart contract philanthropy. The money just goes to the nonprofit. And nonprofit doesn't even know that the money's coming, but then they have a process of engaging the nonprofits and saying, hey, uh, somebody made a donation to you. It's in cryptocurrency. You can either get it in whatever form of currency you want it, or you can keep it in crypto. So they're making it very smooth to bring, introducing the world, nonprofits to this new world. And then there are hyperlocal DAOs like PACTA, which is based in New York City, Tampa Bay DAO, which is based in Florida. Like uh, they all started during COVID. They just saw the difficulties that, you know, and uh, the people were going through. Like Tampa Bay DAO is around artist community. Uh, and so it's just a place for artists to come and it's mutual aid. And there are DAOs around climate. Coconut DAO is very interesting. They're based in Dominican Republic. Um, and the person, he's actually selling, like, like the, there are these coconut plantations in Dominican Republic and he's tokenized in the sense every coconut tree is for $20. So anybody in the world can buy a token. It's a governance token. It is not tradable. Like it's a non-transferable NFT. And he's fundraising for local agriculture. And so anybody who believe in regenerating and preserving plantations, if you're passionate about that cause, you don't have to be a Dominican public person. You can just be anywhere. And so he's got people who bought these non-transferable NFTs from U.S. and Canada and stuff. And he's fundraised. And he's going to now use that money to 
preserve those plantations, coconut plantations. And all for Climate Dow is trying to disrupt Greenpeace. They, their ethos was like, we don't know how the money is being allocated in Greenpeace for what projects, how. Like, we want to make these com- operations completely transparent. So they just booted a Discord server. Anybody who's interested in the cause of taking action around the environment just drops in. They provide them like a really a very easy orientation to whole Web3 ecosystem. So if you are in climate and, and want to do something around it, I think it's a great place to begin with. So the, yeah, you can just basically have a doubt around everything. And I'm going to just show you in terms of how transparent these organizations are, because building in public is the most important thing when you're trying to build a community. And so this is Coconut Dao, and they use Chambers. And they've done, Coconut Dao's done a great job with documentation. And so this is every blog piece, every Twitter, like everything is being documented. And, and see this, this is publicly view, viewable information. And so if he has a volunteer tomorrow. He doesn't have to spend too much time. The volunteer can just dig in and find information here. This is DreamDAO. So DreamDAO is actually a nonprofit in the United States. They are 501c3. The nonprofit is called Civics Unplugged. But this is like a little DAO within the nonprofit. So they, are, they wanted to, what they do originally or what they can still do is basically provide scholarships to high-performing Gen Zs from all over the world. And so they said, we are anyways like trying to train these Gen Zs. Why don't we train them in Web3 and the good side of Web3? And so they launched something called a Dream DAO in the, and uh, this is the view of the Discord server. Like this is what it looks like, a Discord, like I'll start here, rules, guide, announcements, uh, basically. And they provide one-on-one mentorship to them and they even fundraise for them so they could go and attend various Web3 events that take place all over the world. And they try to get them internships with the organ- startups that are building a space so they get hands-on experience. And so this is their way of like just introducing the next generation to the next, <laughs> the current technologies and how they can leverage those. Uh, and this is, was my Discord. So I launched a DAO myself last year to write this book on impact DAOs. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to research impact DAOs and I'm going to have these conversations, I need to have a very hands-on experience with DAOing. So I can ask the right kind of questions. So I just wanted to have a very immersive experience. And so we, I launched a Discord myself. These are the values that I put down initially. And as my community, as more and more people learned about it and started dropping in, I'm like, okay, let's collectively decide what our values are going to be. And, and these, if you see on the side, is all the organizations that we interviewed or were part of our research. I just created a channel for them. And so you could just put in all the research that you're doing on the internet about them. And we also had one-on-one conversations with each one of them. And then every book chapter was like a channel, like a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And then we had owners for these different chapters. There were like at least three people that were owning a chapter each. And so we had 22 people by the end of the, by the time we published the book, which is online, we had 22 people who collaborated from 12 different countries to write this book. And so this is what it looked like. And this, uh, I want to just show about Snapshot. As I said, this is what takes place if you see a little, this like a little hash, this gets recorded on the blockchain. And this is a big green DAO, the Kimball Musk DAO that I was talking about. And, I, and this is a proposal that was there. So it's not only just about grant making, it's also about top level decision making. So I think the idea was initially at that point of time that anybody who donates $1,000 or more to big green should also be given a right to vote on how the grants should be spent. And I think came up as a proposal on Snapshot because a lot of them didn't agree with that. Just because you are dating, that means you get access to vote, like whether you know the situation or not about how this money should be spent, like whether you have the knowledge or not. And that proposal came from vote and you can see like IPFS is how it's stored, like it's distributed, the voting when it started, end date, snapshots. It's like your entire organization's history is on the blockchain, it's online. It's so it's really fascinating. And they, you can go to a big green DAO. You can go to, in fact, almost any DAO that you can, you find on impactdaos.xyz, the website, and go to the snapshot. You'll see like how the proposals go through. This is PactDAO. This was the one that's based in New York City. They actually put out their vision, the mission statement on this publishing platform I was talking about called mirror.xyz. And they just minted that mission vision statement and they raised almost 20 ETH at that point of time it was $37,000 it could turn you can turn your mission vision why are you starting like people start with a light paper but this light paper is just basically a roadmap why are you starting what you're doing and you can mint that 
and fund make that into a fundraising thing as well. Or you can just let pe people mint for free. It's okay. You, people would want to hold on to it because they see meaning in their work and everything does not have to be about money. And so you can allow them to just mint it for free. So this is for the Impact Our course that I recently launched based on all the research that we did. And I issued like an on-chain certificate to people. We see this going to be a big potential if you're running any courses online. You can, you can issue these certifications on chain and it means you can, e wallet address is basically the address that you create on the blockchain, which is when you create a MetaMask wallet, you can have many addresses. And so you can put your wallet address over there. If you don't have, like a lot of people who took the course didn't have a wallet address because they were like total newbies. I just send it to the email ID, but whenever in the future, they have a wallet. They can just sync it up with it and, and live on the blockchain for that. It's already on the blockchain. They just don't know. They don't have an address, but it's been emailed to them that the certificate is there on the chain. And so you can view the contract and stuff. And it was very easy. Like I'm not a software person. Yeah, I don't do coding or anything. I just understand this field really well. But for me, it was very easy. It was totally no code. I didn't have to use any technology. I just had to create, I upload this image, create, define what the fields are and just issue. And so the untransferable tokens is something that I see is going to play a big role. Just, uh, you, just recognizing your donors, your volunteers, just giving them these certificates that they're proud to display because they can display these certificates as their Twitter profile pictures. Twitter lets you do that. And also they live in their wallet. This is like an inside view of a MetaMask wallet. So one of the person who took the course, he shared the screen with me and this is how it shows up in his wallet. And next time he's anywhere in the world and somebody's any person say in, I would say, let's say in, in London is doing a session, is doing an event and they can just say anybody with an impact dark course badge and anybody who's done so-and-so activity, they're all allowed in for this event. So they, it's very permissionless. And all you got to do is flash your badge if you happen to be in London and then you have access to that event, right? So I feel like this building on-chain reputation is the next big thing. And this is what's going to get a lot of people, change makers, excited because you are acknowledging people in the space who are contributing either the time or through money or through skills or whatever. You, you're acknowledging them and they're building their reputation and it, the reputation lives with them. It doesn't live within the confines of LinkedIn or Twitter or any other thing. It lives in their wallet. If they don't have a wallet right now, it's with them. But once we believe everybody in the future will have a wallet and it will live with them there. So yeah. So how to get started? This is my final slide. Everything, move everything on the internet. Just be very internet first, have internet first mindset. Don't think about anything else. Just force yourself to think of how you're going to operate on the internet. Start with the Discord server and start inviting your community there. There are nonprofits that have transitioned into becoming a DAO. And there's one in Vancouver that did that. And they continue to meet their people where they are, which is through emails. But at every email reminding them to join the Discord, this is where we're meeting. This is where you get to meet a bigger community. Not just people who are part of a team, but also people who are excited about the mission. You can meet them. This is one place on the internet where we collaborate, where we meet. And you can have different events within Discord. You can have audio events there and you can have onboarding sessions there. Like it's just your home on the internet. It's your office on the internet. You can have NFT badges. These Basically, these are images. NFT is basically images with some hash that's on the blockchain, which just proves that it's been awarded to you. It's highly transparent. It is verifiable and it is portable. You can take with them. So you can start recognizing them with that. And there are protocols that make it very easy. All you've got to do is upload that image and define the parameters and just deploy the smart contract. It's that easy. Build in public. Do everything and have open conversations. Have Don't even, have, if you're on Twitter, if you think your community, a lot of them, you have a big following there. On LinkedIn or Twitter, have audio spaces there. Both these platforms enable have enabled audio. And so have those spaces instead of having a Zoom call, which is still closed. But just engage everybody. And then experiment. There is no, as I said, decentralization is a journey and you will figure it out. What's the best way to decentralize with your community? Recognizing and giving badges is one great way because once you... Once people have collected certain amount of badges or, or they've collected a badge of say 50 hours invested in this, then you can start inviting them for more 
critical decision making. You can say, okay, we invite you for a next board meeting or we invite you to participate in the next grant making process because you've proved, you, you've earned it, you, it's merit based. It's not why I'm excited about these non transfer badges is because before this, NFTs were all for people who could afford, who could buy, but this is very merit earned based. And so you're decentralizing with that ethos, which is much better than somebody who can afford to buy a token and then start participating in the governance. So a lot of big decentralized finance DAOs, their token model is based on who can buy those votes to be able to participate. And it makes it very untrustworthy because sometimes people don't have a skin in the game. And I think it's very important to have skin in the game. So experiment, I would say just experiment is the name of the game. Just begin with it and keep fine tuning it and keep figuring out what works. But the thing is to have this mindset of moving everything on the internet and then just using some of these really simple tools to, to just start exploring the on-chain or the blockchain world. Yeah, let's start dying. That's what we say. <laughs> we, I mean, there's a whole terminology that we have. We don't call departments. We have work streams. We don't call employees. Employees, we have co-contributors. We have like part-time contributors. Like we refer to a community as members. So there's a whole lingo. And I'm trying to like document as much as possible. Again, in a very collaborative fashion, like engaging the community. And let's document all these terminologies, everything. Make it simple for newcomers to understand. So the book that we wrote as a DAO is free to read. It's on impactdaos.xyz. And we are doing more research because there are more organizations coming in uh, and forming DAOs. Like yesterday, I had a conversation with a DAO, which is in the space of decentralized science. They're trying to decentralize science. And they it's called Vita DAO. They recently actually raised money from Pfizer, which is $4.1 million dollars is what Pfizer invested in them. But they start with a community first approach. They research around longevity. They fund biotech startups around longevity. And I did an in-depth conversation, which I'm going to stream it on the podcast very soon about how they DAO, how they structure themselves. And, and they're based in Canada, actually. They're legally incorporated in Canada, but the girl was based in London. And they have a total, they ha the org structure is something what I just showed you. It's, and they, they have tokens they've given. To, when they launched in 2020, we didn't have non-transferable tokens at that point of time, but they launched a token because that was the only standard available. And, and that token now has some valuation. That's another way to see though. But tokens, if you don't want to go down that route, that's totally fine. Now you have non-transferable tokens for governance and people, anybody who holds the beta the token can come and vote on when the scientists submit proposals that I want money for so-and-so biotech startup. They can come and vote on those proposals. And, and everything is visible on Snapshot. It's interesting. And uh, Pfizer has come in and they're not called investor. They're called strategic contributors. And there's a different lingo. And I've even started a Telegram group because I know this is going to explode. Like right now, we all think uh, like we are living our lives on the internet. But we, when it comes to work, we're still going back to old ways of working. Go to the office start, or start a nonprofit, like a brick and mortar kind of thing. But I know this is going to explode. This is the future of organizing for cause, causes. So we have a Telegram group. I even launched a course, which is free. It's like complete distillation of all the research. It's very easy. You don't have to commit to any time. You can take it at your own pace. You can do it in 45 minutes or you can do it in seven days. Take an assessment, which is completely like do it at your own time. And then you get that certificate. And basically it's just quick onboarding into this future way of organizing for causes. And you can join Telegram group and get life support. We have other people who've been dying for impact and you can ask them questions. And so it's like a whole community. It's on Telegram and just seek and get help for ethos. And join a DAO, just maybe join a DAO. Like one of the DAOs, I have about 100 DAOs listed on impactdaos.xyz with the Twitter handles. That's the best way. Every DAO has a Twitter presence. And from there, you can just, every DAO, every DAO with the Twitter handle has the DMs open, like direct messages. You can ask them for the Discord or and just get in and start dying and get that hands-on experience. Yeah, that's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Deepa. That's a really great introduction to this new model. And, and certainly I will say I've been brought into this because in my role over the years, people always come to me and say, should I start a, a nonprofit? Is that the right model for me? And obviously it's got all kinds of complexity from setting up a board to like the need to have like financials audited. And also I think for a lot of projects, they don't want the formality. They're like, oh, we are, we're grassroots and we're community driven. I don't want to have this 
government top down ancient model guiding us because all kinds of interesting things can happen about that. People can come and take over your board and therefore like control of your group. There's all kinds of things that can happen when you take that particular model here. And I think what's Im interesting about this impact now is it starts to say, are there other ways where people, where just informal people come together? Maybe they just want to start a meetup. Maybe they are working on an app. Like I'm like, I built out a Salesforce donation app for local nonprofits. And I don't want it to become fancier or more formal than that, but I do need something to hold a budget, to hold decision-making because there is that benefit of organizations, which is what happens if the lead person gets hit by a bus? And like, now who owns the bank account control? Who owns control to like accessing the lift serve and managing that? And so not having a structure actually can make these projects very vulnerable some level. And so this starts to think through those ideas of like, how do you set up governance? How do you deal with the financial sides of it? So I think this is a really interesting model for people who are thinking about creating a project that aren't quite sure if the nonprofit model or the charity model is the right fit for them. So let's open this up to questions. I see a couple of people come on camera and on mic. And if you are brave, dive in and ask away. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking over you. What do you think about you? Adrian, do you have anything that you want to bring? Yeah, I was out bicycling and I arrived halfway through. And so I'm slightly mystified because it's my first exposure to DAOs called DAOs. Yeah. I'm involved in several nonprofits of two kinds, all Canadian. Some are registered societies and charities. Some are just charities, different governance models. And some of them involve engage in uninsurable activities for which there's a potentially a big risk. So documenting how those uninsurable activities are actually governed wouldn't be a bad idea, but starting from scratch, why would I go the Dao route compared to incorporating it as a society? And I know that you've probably said all that, but give me the answer in less than a paragraph. It's well, all about bringing transparency. I think that's what it is. Bring transparency okay. to the work that you're doing because when you build in public, you gain trust. So forget about all the technology and everything. Let's just forget about all the blockchain and everything. Just let's just build in public and Discord, just using that one tool and setting up your departments there and then maybe bringing in chambers for your documentation or even Notion for that matter, whatever tool there is. And just... Start with that. Just bring, invite your community in there. And I recently spoke to this person from Singapore. I worked with him briefly. His name is Jack Sim. He's a social entrepreneur. He started like World Toilet Organization, which is around sanitation. And his community is big. It's all over the world. Like he has this global movement, but they don't talk to each other. When he goes to Berlin, he gets this massive reception. When he goes to New York, he gets this massive reception. But there, these people aren't talking to each other. And he wanted to transition to that because he wants... These people do now be part of one big group. They're all aligned for sanitation as a cause, but they are not aligned as people on the internet right now, all dispersed. And so that's the number one reason. You, whatever your cause is or whatever you're uh, trying to address, you just bring your people together. And the new, the, the next generation is they're anyways learning on the internet, right? They're anyways, uh, during COVID, everything moved. Schooling moved on, on online. So people, kids are so familiar with the internet and this is where your next set is going to come. People who want to associate with the cause, they're not going to go walk into your office. They're going to meet you on the internet. So I think that's the big important part. And then, yeah, making, and then making the decision-making process fair, making it transparent and open. So that's where Snapshot comes in. Like you can make the process open. Anybody can come in. And then when you say community, and if you don't give power to your community, then you're just faking it, right? Like you're saying, we have a community, but you're not really engaging them in any. So if you start slowly engaging them based on the time investment they've made with you, then, you know, you're, dist you're like distributing power to them. You're giving them the power rather than just keeping all to yourself. So I think uh, uh, there's merit in that. Okay. That was really I interesting. Into it. I doubt that was a good match. Sorry, go ahead, Adrian. I doubt there's a good match for us, but I'll look into it. We're already a high trust, well-governed organization. We just have these pockets of uninsurable activity. Yeah. So to me, that's really interesting. I think I came into this event saying, oh, 
DAOs are a technology solution for managing a community. And what I really am hearing here is it's a value and mindset about openness, transparency, grassroots driven. That seems to be what actually really unites this movement rather than a particular set of tools. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, you are. You're totally right. So many DAOs, like when we interviewed as part of our research, like Ukraine DAO, which raised $7 million, they said they just raised with two, they started with two tools, the Google Docs and Multisig, because they needed a bank account on the blockchain for people to quickly, anywhere. Like it doesn't, you don't have to make, like there is no international transactions. There's just one currency transaction. So they start with that. Pacta, for instance, they just started with the Discord and a Multisig wallet. And so a lot of DAOs just start with two or three things. That's it. And then you add tools and you become more sophisticated or learn more about on-chain stuff. And you want to gain more experience, but you don't need, it's not that tooling heavy. It's very simple. It's very simple. And like, for instance, Big Green DAO, they wanted to make their grant making process extremely transparent. They had a clear vision because they want to disrupt philanthropy rather than Kimball and his few people deciding where the money should go. He wanted to engage people from the community, frontline workers. So Snapshot was part of his toolkit from day one. We're going to do Snapshot voting because we want this to be an open. And the other thing he added was Discord. Let's get everybody on Discord. And he's talked about the benefits of adding both these tools to to how he does brand making. With Discord, he said nonprofits who competed for the same funds, now they're all in the Discord and talking to each other. For the first time, they're collaborating because now they're there and then there's a place for them to hang out and all the others in the same space can start talking to each other. And so he talked about the community part more than in one of the podcasts that I recently heard about his downing experience. Awesome. We probably have time for one last question. Anyone else? Well, go for it, Judy. You get to bring it all together. It's going to be a big one. Go. <laughs> There's a number of things that come to mind, including the fact that each one of these tools that you've listed that help make this all work together belong to somebody. So aren't you still putting, relying a, on those things to continue and to not leave yeah, that tool? They do use a mix of Web2 tooling, like Discord, for instance, is by Discord, the company. Discord, you look like we are using Google Meet or we use Zoom. So a lot of Web2 tooling is obviously needed for collaboration because now you're working on the internet and yeah. But like for instance, now there are decentralized social networks, like this Farcaster that I'm part of, which is I own my own identity, Twitter or Instagram, or nobody can shut me down because it's on a protocol. It's distributed. They don't call it platforms. They call it protocol. And it's on the, on, it's decentralized it's on the blockchain. So blockchain basically means it's running on a number of computers or rather than one centralized thing. So it's more decentralized that way. Yeah. So the services. So that's where on-chain identity comes in. Like when you are using a protocol to issue these non-transferable recognition patches, it's on these decentralized protocols. It's not by one service provider. No, I understand that. I'm just saying that is the overcoming objection stage for working with the people in the community to encourage them to get involved in something like this. And like you say, start simple. But thinking of what Adrian had to say too about activities that are uninsured, if you could have a DAO for those activities, would it have an impact on your actual registered nonprofit or charity? Do you have to report what goes on in those DAOs as part of your charitable activities to any registration government? Yeah, like for instance, if you already have a nonprofit structure, it's even more easier because you then are bound by those regulations and you don't want to go to out of it. So everything has reports back. Like for instance, every donor that's giving money to say Big Green DAO, they need to do their KYC and everything. It becomes even more easier because you already have that infrastructure in place. But it's mostly for new organizations that don't want to go through that infrastructure first problem. They just start. And th there are now these other organizations like Open Collective and stuff that can take part of your legal situations, like all the requirements, all the financial requirements for you. You don't have to do it yourself. Did that answer your question, Adrian? No. You think so? Okay, let's try again. So, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. No, I, 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 I understand, not... Deepa, I understand you're trying to ex answer it, but I don't think no, it's I understand the answer. answer. Yeah, I understand the answer. I don't think it's going to fit my situation is what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. There's some situations that certainly won't fit. 
for sure. Yeah. And for me, as I mentioned, trust. I think if you start out with people who are frustrated with the way things work in the world, and you want and have a global view and are hampered by, feel themselves hampered by, again, having to start a nonprofit, which is a poorly understood process by most people who get into it before they find out it is a poorly misunderstood process, that's the place to start. I think for those of us who have been in the sector for years and years and years, through many nonprofits, have seen many models come and go, have dealt with the Luddites that exist within our sectors, then that's their word, not mine, because I don't think it's accurate. But you know what I mean? I see this as being a tremendous amount of work to get yeah. it, anybody on board. Transitioning is harder. Transitioning is definitely it. harder. It may yeah. Be worth it. It's, you've got to really be a champion and you've got to have the trust of those people yourself to get the edge of the wedge in there. Yeah. If you're, if you're in the boomer generation, which is the biggest one coming along, and I'm finding that I'm working with a lot of boomers who are all of a sudden retired and starting to want to be doing their own little businesses and stuff like that. And this is all just apple get to most people. And they've had perhaps been persuaded to buy some cryptocurrency by a nephew who went into it early and then got so there's yeah. a, what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to deal with cryptocurrency at all, too. You can totally, yeah. yeah. Like, for instance, I've been downing and I'm, I don't want to do <laughs> the speculative part of things at all. Like, I'm not here for that. I'm here to see yeah. a different way people are organizing. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to document. A lot of them, yes, once you get in, then you are part of the Web3 community and you start fundraising in cryptocurrencies and you understand the game. You don't have to rely on, there are these other third parties giving block and stuff. Sure. Yeah. And they charge phenomenal fee from nonprofits just to put them ahead in front of crypto donors. But yeah. when you're part of the community, it just automatically it becomes a very natural thing. I think it, it's much more useful to know how the blockchain works and why it's an answer. Yeah. Our major oh yeah, concerns. I mean it's been it's Better. been. Not about Defin crypto, right? It's not about crypto, and <laughs> crypto has earned a mainstream. The mainstream yeah. image is really bad. Obviously, because there are all these grifters and scammers that came into it. But otherwise, if you look, it was the, the Web 1 or what you call when we all started. It was very decentralized. And it's, that's, I think that's the beauty of it. Just think of it as decentralized governance, more power sharing, more owning your stuff okay. yourself. Like Facebook and all was like, we are supplying <laughs> data to them and they're monetizing it for and so throwing us ads. You could start an old folks DAO. Was... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's great. I mean, this Discord server is all you need. And it's not even very well, but I, it's a great place. So just in summary, I set up this black server. I've set up the uh, the Discord server. But can I get anybody to go play? Can I get the younger generation to engage? They're trying to disengage from devices entirely. Getting them to read emails, getting them to look at a calendar. You is, need to meet them. You need to meet them where they are. So maybe if they're on... Well, where they are is a paper diary. That's where they are. They've rejected the world we've built, wonderful it is, as it is, and they want things on a piece of paper. I don't know how to get things onto their piece of paper. I don't... Anyway, we digress. Yes, but yes, that's the truth that there's never a shortcut to community, whether it be tool or it's always the yeah. hard work. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> for organizations that already are, it's, it's hard to transition because I know there was a cooperative in Vancouver that is trying to transition and they had they started a Discord server, but not everybody has moved in there. And they're like really trying to transform the people who've never treated organizations like this. They're more education based. But it, there's a constant reminder every email that goes out it says, Hey, we've got this place too. You can drop in here too. And so parallelly, just start something online that people can be and meet. Yeah, but think of DAOs as cooperatives online. They're just a similar ethos. It's got to be invitational and you got to keep inviting. A few will take it up and others will come. And if then the, young, know, and the younger ones, when they learn about it, they'll join. That's how they find things on the internet. That it's is, uh, the cause, right? It's the cause yeah. and the mission that pulls people. It's the same struggle we've had with nonprofits from the year one. This is nothing new. 
It's just in a different sort of frame. That's all. And it remains, it continues to be difficult, but I think worthwhile. So thank you, Diva. Really appreciate you staying late with us and all of you engaged in the conversation, both in the chat and here in person.